welcome to another conversation about North Dakota history. My name is Gerald Newborg, and I'm with the State Historical Society of North Dakota. And today we'll be talking with Mr. Dan Rylance, who is a historian at the University of North Dakota. Our topic today is the political crisis of 1934. Welcome, Dan. Thanks, Jerry. Glad to be here. You've uh, studied William Langer for a long time, I know. Uh, perhaps no one else in the state's history has been as controversial as, as Langer. How much of that controversy that's, that surrounds Langer was just the man's nature, and, and how much of it was really due to the circumstances and the times in which he, he came to uh, the, the governor's office? It's a good question. Uh, Langer has such a long political career uh, first elected as state's attorney of Morton County in 1914 and uh, was elected U.S. Senator for a third time in 1958. So we have 50 years of, of history to measure against your question about controversy. And my guess is that the answer is probably a combination of both. Uh, certainly uh, the first nonpartisan league uh, from 16 to 21, which Langer was a part of as attorney general, uh, was history made. Uh, yet in 20, he broke with the league and ran against the league candidate for governor. That's Langer controversy. So certainly here's a man with the league and then a turncoat with the league. Langer precipitates that controversy. In the 30s, uh, the Depression gave Langer a second chance. He comes back as the league candidate for governor 12 years after he was a turncoat against it. The 30s adds history making to history made, and so it's a combination there again. His Senate career, uh, I think a mixture of both, uh, was not seated in the U.S. Senate for almost two years. The Senate refused to seat him on the grounds of moral turpitude. Uh, and so, uh, again, controversy, no question. Voting record in the Senate, eccentric, an isolationist foreign policy-wise, uh, very much uh, domestic liberal on uh, federal aid to education, uh, civil rights, uh, ERA for women back in the 1940s and 50s. So I think in fairness uh, to him and to history that uh, probably with a long career, it's, it's both circumstances of history, but certainly the personality of Langer is part of it. When Langer came to the governor's office in 1933, the conditions were, were pretty bleak for the state. Uh, why don't you paint us a little bit of a picture of what the conditions were at that time? Certainly. Uh, you can make an argument that up to 1934, 1934 economically was the worst of times. Uh, rainfall was 9.51 inches. That's a statewide average. That was the lowest year of, of rainfall, and only one year after that, 36 would be lower. Uh, prices for agricultural crops were low, uh, ranging from 98 cents a bushel for wheat, I think, down to 40 and 50 cents for oats and barley. But only a third of the crop that was planted in 1934 actually made it to harvest. Uh, Dust storms of unprecedented uh, in, in the spring, April, and May. There was even talk in Bismarck of evacuating ranchers from western North Dakota. Uh, medical reports uh, documented that people actually died of dust pneumonia in the summer and spring of 34. So temperature-wise, drought-wise, wind-wise, agricultural price-wise, uh, 34 was the pits. It was the worst year uh, we had experienced as a state since statehood. And it was also the culmination of really six or seven of bad years working up to 34, with 34 being the worst. So it was really was the worst of times economically. Why don't we uh, give a little bit of a background on the other major political actor in this, uh, Ole Olson. Uh, he seems to be the forgotten man in many ways, the way Langer is uh, the continuing uh, a person who is of continuing interest and controversy. Ole Olson was a uh, a farmer, a homesteader from uh, uh, around New Rockford. He'd homesteaded there in 1895. Uh, joined the league early as one of the original nonpartisan leaguers, was uh, in that famous 1917 session of the legislature in the House, and then served three terms in the Senate. Uh, and was strong in the equity movement and the farmers' union movement, and was really a pure leaguer all the way. Uh, did not like Langer's split with the league in 20. Uh, but in 32, with things bad, uh, the league coming back to power, uh, Olson was nominated with Langer's, I, I think, blessing to be his running mate, lieutenant governor. And so they were elected together in 1932 as governor and lieutenant governor, and both, both were elected. Um, soon after Langer took office, uh, uh, he, he got into conflict almost immediately with the league. Uh, 
organization committee over appointments, uh, over philosophy, and, and uh, Olson and Langer broke fairly early in, in the first term. And we have to remember, Jerry, in those years that uh, constitutional offices are only two-year terms, and so it's, you know, it's almost, you start running for re-election almost after you, you've won your, your election. Uh, and uh, so they're pitted against each other. The controversy in 34 for Olson is more limited than the controversy for Langer. Uh, Langer is, uh, is convicted of a federal felony uh, by a, a, a jury in Bismarck uh, and sentenced. Only after he becomes a convicted felon does Ole Olson really enter the picture because it's Ole's interpretation that once the conviction uh, was handed down by the jury, Bill Langer was no longer constitutionally eligible to hold the office of governor. And so Ole is the one then who goes to the court. Uh, Ole is the one who swears himself in as governor. He precipitates, in part, the crisis. But in precipitating it, I think he also brings forth a solution. Let's back up a little bit and try to set the, the, the chronological stage for, for the uh, crisis. Langer is uh, inaugurated in January of 1933, actually before Roosevelt is, is inaugurated in, uh, in March. Uh, and uh, we have about a year's time, a little about a year and a half before the, the crisis comes to a head. What are some of the key elements or developments along that uh, timeline? Good question. Uh, a local newspaper editor said in '33 that relief was the hardest thing in the world to administer. Uh, if it's difficult today, it was much more difficult in 1933 because there were no guidelines and, and there were no, uh, no precedent for, uh, for federal relief. The federal government was primarily interested in the early New Deal programs like FERA, Federal Emergency, Emergency, I think the key word, just getting money back as quickly as they could to the states, uh, giving the governor full authority to distribute the money uh, as he or she wanted to. Uh, no post audits, <laughs> no grant proposals. <laughs> this is just straight money. And, and, uh, uh, and so uh, Langer uh, very early uh, was, was getting millions and millions of dollars. And uh, uh, he was also the only Republican governor elected in 1932. And uh, immediately there begins to be a series of letters and accusations made by Democrats in, in, uh, in North Dakota, the few that there were, uh, but more after FDR's victory because they thought, hey, this is a new time for the Democratic Party. Uh, disgruntled people who didn't like Langer. And so the message that's getting back to Roosevelt, to Harry Hopkins and some of the other people is, we have a governor, a Republican governor, uh, who's misusing this, this wonderful federal relief money that is coming out of Washington. And we want you to know about this. Um, Hopkins sends Lorraine Hickok, a journalist, uh, really Eleanor Roosevelt's press secretary. She comes to North Dakota in, uh, between fall and winter of 34, November, first week, and uh, writes back to Hopkins that uh, this Langer is a blowhard. He's running around the state uh, claiming full credit for the relief. Uh, he's got a wheat embargo, which is a joke, but he's taking credit for the increase in the price of wheat. Uh, doesn't believe in the New Deal. He's attacking Roosevelt daily. I mean, this guy is, is questionable. And so, uh, you know, and Langer brought on some of it himself, your initial question about controversy. Langer used to make, love to make fun of the, the college professors who were writing agricultural New Deal programs. He called for the resignation of Wallace as Secretary of Agriculture. And at one time, he even attacked the president. Uh, he referred to uh, the president at, a, at an audience saying that, you know, we just uh, kicked one son of a bitch out of office and we can do it again. Uh, the farmers were the forgotten people of the, uh, of the, of the New Deal administration. And so, uh, you know, politically, uh, never a threat to Roosevelt, but this is early in his first term. I mean, these signs are getting back to Washington. Langer's a troublemaker. Uh, he's got a big mouth. And so a lot of the, uh, the controversy he brought on himself. Uh, the controversy leads to confrontation. Uh, an investigation begins both in Washington and through the U.S. District Attorney's Office in North Dakota. P.W. Lanier, uh, who's an active Democrat, uh, as you know, the, the, the judicial branch or that part of the judicial branch, the, uh, the U.S. District Attorneys go to the, the president or the party that's in office, and P.W. Lanier, a Democrat, comes in with FDR. Uh, this is an interesting case for Mr. Lanier to get Bill Langer, the Republican governor of North Dakota. They have two grand juries, uh, both in the spring of 1934. The first one comes up with uh, nothing tangible. Uh, the second grand jury indicts Langer and eight of his associates, uh, minor and major uh, 
department heads in, in, in his Bismarck administration for basically misusing federal relief money. Uh, and uh, that was brought out in the spring, and uh, a jury trial is set up in Bismarck uh, the last 26, 27 days, near the end of May through mid-June of 34, with temperatures of 105 and 108 in the shade in, in western North Dakota. So it's a hot time weather-wise, it's a hot time political-wise. The jury, on uh, late on the evening of June 16, 34, in fact about midnight, brings in a verdict against Langer and I think five of the eight associates. Uh, the uh, judge, presiding judge, uh, Andrew Miller, uh, decides to uh, wait on the sentencing because what's happening simultaneously in North Dakota is a primary election. And <laughs> to confuse the matter, and I think precipitate the crisis, Langer is reelected on June 27th, overwhelmingly as a second term, Republican term, for governor. Ole Olson is defeated. Uh, as I said earlier, he was, he was on the outs with Langer, and, and Langer basically replaced him by a, a man by the name of Walter Welford, a state senator from up in the northeastern part of the, the state in Pembina County. So Ole is basically out of a job. Uh, Langer, although convicted, uh, has at least gone through the nomination process, he, and he's an overwhelming choice of over 100,000 people to be their candidate for governor in the fall. That precipitates what I call the constitutional crisis, uh, which lasts from June 16th, 17th, the day of conviction, until July 17th, the day the North Dakota Supreme Court issues an opinion uh, removing Langer as governor and making Ole Olson the acting governor of North Dakota. What were the, uh, just to give an idea of what the magnitude of this, these charges were, what, what were the specific charges that Langer was convicted of? We have two parallel things going on, and I think it's important to, to separate them. Uh, Langer was forcing uh, a kickback of 5 or 7 percent of a person's monthly salary as a state employee to run his newspaper, the leader, or to sell subscriptions to the leader, whichever came to 5 percent. Nothing illegal about that. Uh, immoral, perhaps, uh, but certainly in the context of the time, it was, it was a habit that was going on in many states. Uh, what the issue began, began in, or started it was that uh, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, and I guess that's the issue, the government said it was conspiracy, it was knowingly, he also began, or some of his associates began, to also uh, fleece those people who were on federal relief to contribute to the newspaper. In the end, uh, although the judge said it made no difference the amount, they only could prove that Langer and his associates actually collected $179.50 of all of this million dollars of federal relief money in days when it was just handed out with no checks and balances. Judge says that doesn't matter. The issue is, you know, the intent and the conspiracy. And so he was convicted of misusing $179.50. So with Langer convicted, uh, Olson then precipitates the crisis by doing what? Precisely. Ole says that Bill's no longer governor. Uh, he's no longer governor because he's a convicted felon. Uh, he asked the Attorney General to begin removal proceedings against Bill Langer. P.O. Sathry says, no way. Uh, uh, we have to go through the appeal process. He's also a Langer appointee or a Langer member of the Langer crowd, and so he's not interested at all in, in doing that. So Ole makes another move on the chessboard. Ole finds a judge and raises his right hand and takes the oath of office. He's governor of North Dakota. So we have one governor in the governor's office. We have one governor outside the governor's office. Langer responds by a series of events, he declares martial law, uh, he calls a special session of the legislature, and even drafts a document called the Declaration of Independence. And all this takes place after Ole swears himself in as governor. I'll tell you an interesting story. Uh, one of the local papers uh, said that Ole, uh, a day after he swore himself in, was feeling so good that he went into a Bismarck cafe that played German music. And uh, he kind of made a an appearance and kind of showing off that he was the governor and came to sat down at the table and he expected the uh, you know the the German orchestra to play maybe Hail to the Chief or some appropriate song and he no longer sat down and when the, the guy tapped the baton and you'll never guess what they played. What did they play? Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? <laughs> the big bad wolf. Uh, you know those were that was a Langer cafe obviously and and so uh, Ole didn't get to the the song Hail to the Chief. Um, the court at first, you see, needs a way 
You know, the chord just doesn't reach out. It has to, it has to go up through a, a logical progression. And finally, Ole works up through the lower courts rather than through the Attorney General's office. And the court, uh, concerned about martial law, uh, concerned about uh, you know a special session of the legislature and this declaration of independence, uh, they feel that there is really a, a uh, perhaps even a change in government uh, coming uh, that will be illegal and and, uh, and they're very worried and so they they decide on a four to one vote on two issues and the two issues are combined. One is that they uh, they argued that uh, Langer had suffered a disability. Uh, the dis disability being that he was no longer a qualified elector because he had been convicted of a felon. He had lost his voting rights, he was no longer elector. And second, because he was disqualified as an elector, uh, he could not be governor. He had to maintain that during his two years of office. And so on a four to one vote, uh, they, uh, they said that the office had to go to the lieutenant governor. Uh, there was one moment there where uh, it was not sure whether the court decision would be accepted by Langer. Martial law is still in effect. There are guardsmen outside his office, uh, you know, and patrolling the, the, the mansion. Uh, and the adjutant general, a man by the name of Herman Brokop, uh, who supposedly was a Langer man, uh, made a rather tr dramatic uh, announcement uh, right before the court handed down their decision, which really quelled uh, the constitutional crisis. He said he would abide by the decision of the court. He would only serve the governor who the court decided was the governor of North Dakota. When the court ruled four to one that Langer could no longer be governor, that Olson would be governor, Brokop said, Holy Olson is the governor of North Dakota and I will follow him. With that call, with the militia clearly to go with Brokop, Langer gave up. He peacefully gave up his office and, uh, and Ole moved in. Ole never moved into the mansion though. Uh, and there are conflicting stories whether Ole ever tried or not. I think at best, he didn't try very hard. Uh, Lieutenant governors only come to Bismarck during the term of the, of the legislative session. The session was over with. Uh, Mrs. Olson gave an interesting interview to the New York Herald Tribune. Uh, Ole has nine children, he and his wife, and they're on a 360-acre farm up by New Rockford. And a New York Herald Tribune reporter called Mrs. Olson, and, and, she, and he said, what do you think? Are you moving to Bismarck? And she said, no. She said, uh, you know, we belong in New Rockford. She said, I haven't gone many places yet in my life, and, and I don't see any reason to start now. Uh, she said, just because all these acting governors, the kids should stay in New Rockford. That's where their home is, that's where their school is. And she said, I have no intentions of moving to Bismarck. So Langer stayed in the uh, governor's mansion yes. then until, uh, until Moody was? Until Moody took office in, in the first week of January of 1935. While all of this was going on, I'm sure there was reaction outside of, uh, just outside of the court and out of the, outside of the government. How, how did the uh, newspapers react to this controversy? Um, I think differently, and I would split the daily press from the weekly press. If you read the daily press from the time Langer took office until, well, actually, uh, you know, through 35, 36, the four dailies, the big dailies, the Herald in, in Grand Forks, the Forum in Fargo, Minot in Bismarck are very anti-Langer, and, and they cover him daily in, in lots and lots of words. We're not talking small snips, we're talking major headlines. And that really was one of the reasons that precipitated Langer wanting to start his own newspaper. He couldn't stand the daily criticism that these four dailies were pouring on him. Huh? Uh, so there's a, the four dailies are very anti-Langer. The leader, Langer's paper, obviously is very you know, pro-Langer and anti-dailies. So I kind of went out you know, and, and looked at the weeklies. I looked at every weekly in 434, and I get a much different uh, uh, feedback from the weeklies. Uh, I get several things in, in reading the, the weeklies. One is that they don't trust the dailies at all. Uh, they really uh, think the dailies are trying the case in the paper before the legal process is trying them, and so they're neutral on the trial. Uh, then they split, uh, you know, on Langer, Olson, and uh, some people are even saying, you know, uh, vote for Langer in or out of jail. Uh, an editor in Pierce County says, hey, you know, if you're, if you're campaigning against Langer, don't go to the southern portion of Pierce County because those farmers down there, you know, are really loyal Langer people. They've got their homes because of him and they're not going to take any nonsense from anyone come down there to tell them differently. So there's some extreme loyalties, uh, uh, the anti-daily versus the local weeklies. And the weeklies in those years, I think, uh, as a barometer of 
you know, small town uh, attitudes in, in rural life, uh, the editors are really uh, reflecting the views, I think, of their people. They write good editorials. They're not canned. And, uh, uh, and there's a great variety in, in the editorials. It's a good source of local history, I think, uh, probably up until the late 40s, early 50s, to understand issues of North Dakota at the local level. Did you get any sense of a, of a regional bias uh, out of the weekly newspapers? Uh, obviously, there wasn't any in the daily newspapers, but, but any regional bias toward or against Langer? Yes, I think generally the further west you go in North Dakota, uh, the more pro-Langer it becomes. The weeklies in the valley, the drift prairie moving up maybe to Jamestown and Devil's Lake uh, tend to be anti-Langer or, or at best mildly anti-Langer. You get into the German-Russian counties in the middle of the state, south central, up in that peak in that German triangle up into Pierce County, and then uh, very strong Langer country up in McLean and Divide up in the northwest. Uh, it, breaks, it breaks sectionally within the state. And of course, Langer's voting strength is exactly that. He never covers the Red River, never carries the Red River Valley election. Uh, by the time he's, you know, crossed the river, he's picking up steam and, and he's more successful. Emmons County, uh, of all the elections that Bill Langer ran in, uh, never once did not vote for Langer. There are two or three other counties that, you know, maybe didn't vote against him in one or two elections. But Emmons County, Linton, down in that hardcore German Russian territory, very, very strong Langer country. Do you get any sense of uh, of how the how the court was thinking when they when they made the uh, when they really came up with this decision? Any uh, individual justices' views? Uh, there is some uh, some historical material, primary material. Uh, Alexander Burr, who's one of the judges, uh, wrote quite a bit about the instance of thirty four and, and viewed through his eyes or through his pen. He's very very nervous about Langer's use of the militia, the call for the special session, and is scared to death of this Declaration of Independence. I think in Justice Burr's mind, here is a man who's willing to sacrifice the democratic form of government to maintain political control of North Dakota. He's voting to oust Langer to save the democratic form of government in the state of North Dakota. And he views it in, in, in that, that strong of language. Now, he doesn't like Langer. He's strongly anti-league. And I don't think you can separate those from him. But he, he's convinced by removing Langer that he is saving, saving the form of government that, that you and I know in, in the state of North Dakota. How fair do you think that, that fear was? Or is that, was that a reasonable assumption for him to make? I don't think so. Uh, I think Langer played the game as long as he could. Uh, and the trials, quite honestly, Jerry, are, are, uh, are much different uh, sort of environment than what you and I would see today. All of the people involved in the trials are really partisans. Uh, the judge who heard the case uh, was the last of Alexander McKinsey's appointees, uh, strongly anti-Langer, should have removed himself from the case. There was only one federal judge in North Dakota in the 1930s, and obviously he did not want to remove himself from the case. Huh? Uh, the prosecuting attorney is nominating Thomas Moody for governor of North Dakota in the Democratic Convention in Minot in May, at the same time that he's asking for a conviction of Langer. So, uh, you know, it, it's a different ballgame. The, the trial is, in a sense, a, a mini-drama of, of, of the political crisis. And uh, so I, I think Langer viewed this as a, as a political uh, exercise, and, and he played the political game as long as he wanted. He had actually moved out his files out of the governor's office two or three days before the court decision, which to me indicates that he was ready to go. And, and uh, I seriously doubt that he would, would have used the National Guard once the Supreme Court decision was handed down. Langer is removed from office. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Ole Olson is in office, but Ole Olson is not up for election He's for governor. governor. So what happens next? First of all, uh, Langer's convicted felony charge not only removes him from the governor's office, it removes him from that nomination process that we talked about in the June primary. He, in effect, loses his civil rights. Although nominated, he cannot run in the fall. So the first thing that Langer does is, is go to the Republican or the, Demo or the NPL the executive committee or, and, and gets Mrs. Langer, Lydia Langer, to be the candidate for governor, the only woman, by the way, in our state history who has ever been a candidate for governor, major candidate for governor. Uh, and Walter Welford, uh, the man that he had selected to run against Olson, is, is her running mate. Uh, <laughs> to confuse things, in those days, the governor and lieutenant governor did not run in the same ticket. 
the result of the November election is that Thomas Moody, the Democrat, defeats Mrs. Langer for the governor's race, but Walter Welford, the NPL Republican endorsed candidate, defeats the Democratic candidate for lieutenant governor. So or leaving 34, going into 35, we have a Democratic governor and an NPL Republican lieutenant governor. So, but Langer is still behind the scenes. Walter Welford is, is in a sense, Langer's appointee, yes. So the next, the next step is, uh, is Thomas Moody. Uh, what happens with, with him? Right. Well, the Democrats thought that this was, the, this was the beginning of their dream, that they had elected FDR in 32, and two years later the New Deal had spilled over to the state office, and they had elected only the second Democratic governor in the history of the state, John Burke being the first. Um, Langer re-enters the, the process immediately. Uh, he has some lawyer friends in Minneapolis uh, who provide him with documentation that Thomas Moody had voted in a city election in Minneapolis in 1930. You say, so what? Well, the, the so what is that our Constitution is very strict on a five-year continuous residency being a mandated constitutional requirement for someone to run for a state office. If Thomas Moody had indeed voted in Minneapolis in 1930, been elected governor in 34, he failed by one year to meet that minimum state constitutional requirement. And so Langer, uh, through a, a judge up in northeastern uh, North Dakota, uh, begins, in, in effect, a court ouster proceeding against the newly elected Thomas Moody with his friend Walter Welford waiting in the wings for this decision. This is even though Moody really wasn't a carpetbagger. He had been uh, a long-term resident. In, of someone said, uh, gee, why penalize a man who's been in the state 28 years and happened to be out of the state for three months? Uh, the court doesn't want, I mean, this is the same court that removed Langer, and then even more so because there's been an election of the court, so it's even more anti. The court doesn't want to oust Tom Moody, uh, but they're forced to. The House of Representatives initiates impeachment proceedings against Tom Moody. It's an NPL legislature. And the court again, I think, saying, wow, and we just got out of this. Do we have to do this again? Views another crisis coming. You know, is it better for peace and tranquility, order and government, to have this impeachment proceeding going on with a good chance that Moody could have, in effect, be tried by the Senate and be removed? Or is it better to go back as a court and remove him? And so they really didn't want to. But Moody only lasts 26 days as governor of North Dakota before the court on a, court on a five to zero vote unanimously rules that Tom Moody is not qualified to be governor of North Dakota and that the office must necessarily devolve upon lieutenant governor. So we have four governors, Jerry, in seven months. And behind the scenes, of course, Bill Langer is, oh, is still working. Oh, very much so. And just as Mur Burr, uh, in fact, in the, in the court proceeding, uh, Langer's personal lawyer, Francis Murphy, argues the case for the state, and it just galls Justice Burr. Uh, you know, he said, who is this Murphy? What's he doing up here? And why is the Langer machine prosecuting uh, Moody in this court? And, uh, you know, Langer was, Langer won. He, he, he beat the court in a sense at their own game. They ousted him, and then he turns around and gets the court to oust Moody and get Welford in as, as acting governor of North Dakota. And while this is all going on, of course, Langer is still appealing his yes. convictions. Yes. Uh, he appeals the original court decision uh, and is not uh, decided until late December of 35. The court says, although morally, and they really slapped him hard, they found no evidence for the conspiracy that was required. And so they, uh, they, they acquitted him of the original charge. In the meantime, he's into a series of other trials, an affidavit of prejudice against Miller, the judge, he goes into two, three, and four other cases. He's convicted or, or tried for trying to bribe the nephew of the second federal judge, a Judge Wyman from South Dakota. And it just goes on and on and on. It's not until 36, with people of North Dakota really unsure about this guy, even more so now than ever, uh, whether he is a you know a, a reputable person or not. Eventually, he is you know he is removed. He's never he never goes to jail. He's never sentenced. The original uh, case is, is eventually appealed, but it takes a long time. But he does get his civil rights back. And he, does get his, and, his, and he gets his political career back. And he gets his political yeah. career back. The irony, I guess, of the court decision, uh, if there is an irony, is that the court, by removing Langer, really prolonged his career in part. Uh, the court, by removing Moody, terminated you know, his career. Moody never ran for public office again. 
Langer takes a long time to convince the majority of voters in North Dakota that he is still a reliable and viable candidate. So what Bill does for the next 12 years, he says, if I can't get majority vote in this state, I'll engineer three-way races. So in 36, Langer defeats Walter Welford, his friend who doesn't want to retire for governor, and gets only 36% of the vote in a three-way race in the fall and is elected governor. Fails in 38 for the U.S. Senate seat, and in 1940 is elected to the U.S. Senate with only 40% of the vote, defeats Lynn Fraser, a three-term incumbent senator, again getting less than the majority vote, getting only 40, I think, 0.4% of the vote. It's not until 1946, or 12 years after this crisis of 34, does Langer ever get more than 50% in any election that he runs in. And so I think it takes people in North Dakota a long time uh, to decide, at least majority-wise, to, to vote for Langer. But he just, his staying power is phenomenal. Uh, he survives, and, and uh, of course he's elected then to three terms in the U.S. Senate, starting in 19, and dies in office in November of 1959. What about Ole Olson? Uh, his career is a little different afterwards. Ole's well, career is a little different. Uh, Ole never seeks, nor does he gain political office after finishing out as acting governor of North Dakota in 1934. Thomas Moody, however, thinks Ole is a pretty fine person, and he appoints him highway commissioner in January of 1935. Ole serves, however, only three months, because when Walter Welford comes in as lieutenant or as acting governor, he removes Ole. And ironically, or perhaps not ironically, Ole did the same thing that Bill did in 34. Ole says, you can't remove me. I'm going to stay in this office as highway commissioner. Goes to the court. The court says, no, acting governor Walter Welford has absolute legal and constitutional power, the right to remove you. And so Ole then is forced out of office but not before another constitutional or another court case. Ole then retires from public life. He goes back to his farmstead uh, in uh, New Rockford. He farms actively, I think, till after World War II. Uh, moves into New Rockford uh, and dies rather peacefully after a, a week or two illness and, and dies on January 30th of 1954. The, uh the only survivor then out of, out of all of this really is uh, William Langer. Is William Langer, yeah. The long-term survivor. The long-term survivor. When you uh, have researched this, uh, what, what are some of the sources, uh, for example, uh, for the study of Langer or, or Olson or, or the other participants? Fortunate in, in, in both cases that there are actually manuscript collections, papers, primary papers of both Governor Langer and Governor Olson. Uh, the Langer papers are, are voluminous, uh, about a million items uh, covering his life from early teenage years right up until his death in the Senate in November of 59. About 800 boxes, about a million pieces of paper. Uh, so a lot of Langer, maybe too much Langer in the sense that's the problem. Uh, and the 30s are just very, very full of, of, of letters of all sorts of, of, of issues, jobs, etc. The Olson collection is also, however, available. It's at Fargo at, at the North Dakota Institute for Regional Studies. It's a good collection. It's about eight boxes. doesn't have the length, but Ole didn't have the tenure that, that Langer did. Uh, to my knowledge, no one's done a published article on, on, on Ole Olson, and I think it's time they do. The, the papers are uh, quite complete. Uh, we get a, a, a glimpse of a man who ate, slept, and believed in the original ideology of the League. He used to mortgage his farm to keep the League going in the early years. He's really strong in, in, you know, in trying to balance the economic disadvantage of, of the agricultural farmer against Twin City and other interests. And, and he's, 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 a, he's a true believer in the League. And, and he has a large family. Ole is not a wealthy person. Uh, a small farm, and you just get the feeling of a man who's very committed, you know, to the original league. A man that really, you know, lived most of his life, uh, you know, in public office, fighting for the original aims and beliefs of the nonpartisan league. How would you gauge the uh, the scholarship on Langer? We do not have at this point a a balanced biography of Bill Langer, and I think the major reason we don't is is because his career is so darn long. Uh, we really have two Langers, I think. I think we have a pre-U.S. Senate Langer from 1914 to 1940, including the 30s, which in and of themselves is a, is, a, is a major hurdle. And then we have 19 years in the U.S. Senate. So I think to do Langer well, a person might almost have to, uh, to break him into two volumes, which is just, you know, I think beyond uh, a lot of people's research time. 
I think the real Langer, personally, uh, I, I guess is before the Senate. I think Langer's career in the Senate is sort of a footnote. You know, an older man who's earned his spurs becomes a fantastic uh, <laughs> errand boy for the constituents of North Dakota. I think a legacy that has been passed on clearly to every elected representative that has served North Dakota and Washington since. Milt Young used to tell me in an interview that uh, he just couldn't keep up with Langer's personal touch, that after a 12-hour day on the Hill, Langer would come back to his office and from 8 to midnight would write in handwritten notes at the bottom of letters, paragraphs to friends. Senator Young said after 12 hours he was tired, he wanted to go home. He just couldn't compete with that. But Langer did that day after day, year after year. And his service to the state, friends or enemies, didn't make any difference. You know, if you had a problem, you know, go see Langer. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's another side to him, too. Um, I think time is, is probably uh, about right for a, a more serious thing. I think, uh, you know, uh, the populace that, that grew up with Langer and voted for him against him is sort of, uh, has gone away and, and that, you know, that test of either being for or against Langer, either bitterly for or bitterly against is sort of, it's more of a neutral climate now. I, I think the time probably is, is good to, uh, to do that, but it's complicated because of a long, long career. What about uh, on the other participants or the other actors at this time? Is there much written about uh, Moody or Welford or, or even about this, uh, this whole controversy? To my knowledge, there's no article on Tom Moody. There's no uh, academic or scholarly article on Walter Welford. Uh, there are some Moody papers, mainly the governor's papers. But in addition to that, Tom Moody was a, a newspaper reporter all over North Dakota. And uh, he... Uh, he would be an interesting subject because editorially he wrote editorials with his name. Uh, he also became the Federal Relief Administrator <laughs> after uh, he was removed as governor. So uh, again, I, I think uh, you know he's, these are important people in our state's history, and, and uh, we really uh, we need to do more work on these people. Is there anything that we haven't uh, covered in uh, in dealing with this crisis that? Uh that you think we should be talking about? Perhaps a little bit on, 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 uh, on a little bit on the economic relationship to the political. Um, I have just a, a theory or an idea that Langer's difficulties, his political difficulties in 34, were much easy, easier to be understood by people who were in a sense going through almost the same difficulties. Uh, farm mortgage foreclosures, no crops, poor crops, drought, etc. I think it was easier to maybe look at Bismarck and Langer and say, God, I mean, he's going through the same things we are. Also, here was a man who was trying his darndest to alleviate their suffering with a variety of proclamations, the moratorium on foreclosures, etc. So at least from the standpoint of the small family farmer, uh, it didn't make any difference to them whether Bill Langer was in trouble with the law. They were in trouble with the law. Uh, and he was still their man. There are politicians today that, that uh, look back at, uh, at the actions that Langer took and uh, speak of them quite favorably. Mm -hmm. What type of parallels would you draw between the, the drought and the, cri the farm crisis of today and, and uh, the activities and crisis of the 1930s? Good question and a difficult one to answer. Um, no question that the economic parallels, although I don't think history repeats itself exactly, directly, there certainly are some parallels. Huh? Uh, farmers in the 20s, uh, really uh, with an assumption that wheat was going to stay at $3 a bushel, went out and, and did what their grandfathers and fathers told them they should never do, and that is they, they overinvested. They mortgaged the farm for another 160 acres. They went into mechanization. They bought a tractor. They bought a, a truck and then spent the rest of the decade and a half trying to pay off those mortgages on a dollar wheat. I think farmers in our state in the mid-70s, in some ways younger farmers again, probably not listening to their fathers and grandfathers when Durham was seven, eight, nine dollars a bushel, went out and bought a, another $40,000 combine or went and bought the neighbor's farm, uh, again assuming that they could pay off that debt quickly on, on eight and nine dollar wheat and then struggled or failed couldn't pay it off on three and four dollar wheat. So I think that parallel is very close. Political parallel doesn't seem to be there at all. Uh, there is no uh, political crisis in North Dakota in, in the 70s or, or in the 80s. Uh, politics, in a way, uh, is sort of removed from the economic crisis, 
although certainly, uh, you know, candidates uh, both at the congressional level and the state level are certainly addressing the needs of the farmers of the state. But, uh, you know, we're not misusing federal relief money or, or whatever. It, it's, it's different politically. Some of the, uh, the other differences would be perhaps in, in the infrastructure that's, that's already built in, wouldn't it? Definitely. Uh, and, and remembering what that editor said in 3344, what is this relief? You know, we don't know how to administer the, the federal programs. Another irony is perhaps is that the federal government in the 30s with these programs, in a sense, was the, the savior economically for the farmer. In the 80s, <laughs> farmers are bringing suit against the same federal agencies that were created in the 30s to save them. And now they are sort of in conflict against each other because those, they have become solidified and they have become the major borrowers and lenders. And, and so there's, a, you know, there's now a conflict between the farmer and, and the New Deal programs of the 80s, uh, whereas in the 30s they were, they, were, they were with each other. Now they're suing you know, federal agencies. But the, the fact is that, that they didn't know about any of these. I mean, these programs didn't exist hey, prior to that yeah, time. Yeah, and I think for young people, uh, even people our ages, uh, you and I are, are, are products of a, uh, a federal-state relationship that we've always had, huh? And there was no federal-state relationship between 33 or 40, 34, really, in terms of anything that you and I have, you know, have grown up with and what our children probably will grow up with. So, yeah, it's, it's entirely different. I think that probably covers as, uh, the topic as... Uh as extensively as, as we can. Do you have any concluding remarks that you'd like to make? Well, 34 and 36 were the worst of times. Uh, 88 has not been a real good year. I would hope that the 1990 would, would be the best of times, that we will not continue this drought cycle and hopefully not even have the opportunity to precipitate anything like we had when 36 followed 1934. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank uh, you, Jerry. This has uh, been another conversation about North Dakota history. Our guest has been uh, Mr. Dan Rylance, who is an historian at the University of North Dakota. Uh, thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.